It is the late Triassic period, a time when reptiles have conquered the globe, from the land to the water and even the skies. Though life on the supercontinent of Pangaea is often tough, and thus creates hardy animals, and few are as hardy as Placerius. Thick, round, and robust, these 3.5 meter long herbivores can weigh up to a ton and have few predators as a result. They live in herds with one dominant male as their leader. Only he can mate with the females come the breeding season, though he has to find any other males that want to take his place. This herd comprises of 22 individuals, most of them adults, and an even distribution of males and females. They are easily identifiable, not just because the males are 20% larger than the females, but in their faces. Females lack the signature tusks of the males, though these are not teeth, but extensions of the skull bone. Most of their lives are spent moving between available food and water, and now that the dry season has begun, they are having to spend more time moving in order to fuel their hefty bulk. At around 1.5 meters tall, Placerius are restricted to low browsing, though fortunately they can digest some of the toughest plants that grow in these harsh lands. The biggest problem that will get worse as the dry season progresses will be finding water. As they forage amongst the trees, other strange reptiles are also out and about. In the trees above them is the Drapanosaur. These arboreal creatures look like lizards, but are a much more ancient group of reptiles. They behave much like chameleons, slowly climbing branches looking for insects. They also have a prehensile tail, but on the end of theirs, they have a hooked claw. The little insectivore ignores the slow-moving herd beneath his tree, and moves along a branch hoping to find a meal. The head of Placerius moves towards a shrinking river, and the first members get up to their elbows in the water and begin to drink, eager to fill up while the going is good. Suddenly, one of the Placerius lifts his head up and groans in surprise. Something was biting the herbivore from beneath the water, and as he pulls back, his attacker is revealed. It is a Van Clevia, a strange semi-aquatic hunter with a short skull, long neck, and a covering of interlocking armor. These predators can grow over three meters long, but this one is barely a meter, and in this case, he has bitten off a bit more than he can chew. Even when this is obvious, the Van Clevia kept his jaws clamped on the Placerius' face, making the much larger herbivore grunt in frustration. Eventually though, the Placerius had enough. He pulled his head to the right, and then with all his strength, threw his head and shoulders to the left, lifting the Van Clevia out of the water. The aquatic reptile was ripped away from his target, and he flew through the air spinning horizontally, his long limbs flailing from the shock of suddenly being airborne, till he eventually splashed back down into the river, sending water in all directions. Some of the herd turned their heads, only to see the aftermath of the scuffle. The Van Clevia didn't surface again, having learned a valuable lesson. The herd go back to drinking when another sound interrupted them, though this one is a distress call coming from the back of the herd. Several of their members have spotted another predator, but this one is terrestrial, and much larger. Galloping towards the group is a Sorosuchus, a massive 5 meter Sudosuchian, one of their only threats. Running on four long, powerful legs, the Sorosuchus is far faster than the Placerius, and closes in on the nearest of the herbivores. The young male Placerius turns to defend itself, but before he can charge his attacker, the Sorosuchus turns his open jaws and sinks his teeth into the Placerius' left leg. The victim howls in pain, and tries to stab his tusk into the predator's side, but the Sorosuchus' armor is too thick for him to puncture. The carnivore lets go after inflicting deep wounds on his target's leg, and as the Placerius reels back, the Sorosuchus then bites down on his head, the tips of his jaws biting above the nostrils. A deep bellow is heard, and suddenly the Sorosuchus is lifted up and thrown sideways, before crashing into the dirt with a heavy thud. The predator crawls back to his feet and sees who had intervened in his hunt. It was the dominant male Placerius, come in the nick of time to save his herd member. 
He snorted violently and stared down the intruding carnival, practically begging him to try and retaliate. The Sorosuchus hissed slowly and held his ground for a few seconds, before realizing he was outmatched. He may be longer, faster, and more heavily armored than the Placerius, but he was almost half the weight of the large males, and facing one head-on would likely lead to injury or death. The Predator turned and walked away, contempt to try again another day. Slowly the herd returned to normal. The injured male had sustained some deep wounds, but these would heal with enough time. The dominant male surveyed the area looking for any other threats, doing his duty as leader of the herd. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a species that has changed quite a bit since it was first starred in Walking with Dinosaurs, Placerius. Placerius's first remains were discovered in 1900, which consisted of a humerus, and was named in 1904. Since then, many more remains have been found, most of which came from the Placerius Quarry in Arizona, which is part of the famous Chinle Formation. More on that later. Placerius lived in the Karanian and the Norian stages of the late Triassic between 230 and 218 million years ago. It belonged to the Dicynodontia family and was part of the Kynomyriformes clade, a group of late surviving Dicynodonts with large body sizes. Placerius was the largest herbivore in its environment, reaching 3.5 meters in length, standing 1.5 meters tall and weighing between 800 and 1,000 kilograms. It was a short but stocky animal, with a wide body, likely so it could have a long gut to help it break down the plants it ate. It walked in a semi-erect stance, so though its legs were sprawled out away from its body, it didn't drag its belly along the ground like most reptiles, but it also didn't have its legs directly under itself, like a mammal. The limbs were strong, but were evolved to simply carry its weight, so Placerius would have been a slow mover with a low run speed. The skull was up to 68 centimeters in length and was wide and thick. The back of the skull almost looks like the crest of a ceratopsian. In life, this wouldn't have been visible as it would have been covered by muscle and tissue and would have given the animal a thick neck. At the front of the skull was its beak. Like other members of its family, the beak was long and narrow compared to the short flat beaks of a lot of other Dicynodonts. This has led to the theory that Placerius was a browser, not a grazer, and that it fed on taller foliage similar in the way to black rhinos, with their pointed lips as opposed to white rhinos with their flat lips, who are grazers. With this size and more specialized beak, Placerius may have filled a niche of high browser in its ecosystem, if you consider 1.5 meters high, I suppose. The most distinctive feature of Placerius are its tusks. These are not tusks in the traditional sense, which are usually teeth. These are extensions of the maxilla bone that don't face forward as has sometimes been depicted in the past, but downwards. While it's been suggested that these may have been used to dig up food, just looking at them, it's pretty clear that this wasn't what they were used for. Instead, it is believed that they were simply for display, defense against predators, or for intraspecific combat, when males would fight with each other over dominance or mates. Placerius did have two teeth in its upper jaw, however they don't seem to have even erupted from the jaws, and may have been vestigial. Now let's cover what we found in Placerius Quarry. This site would be discovered in 1930, and contained the remain of 40 Placerius individuals that seemed to have gathered at a small water source, waiting for rain to arrive. They all died together, and would be preserved when the water levels rose again. Scientists have discovered that there are two different morphs present. Ones that are larger in size and have bigger tusks, and smaller ones with barely noticeable tusks. It has been suggested that these may be two different species of Placerius. However, the more accepted theory is that this is simply an example of sexual dimorphism, with the females being the smaller individuals and the males being the larger ones with the more pronounced tusks. This seems likely, as the majority of animals, especially mammals, 
The males are larger and will evolve display features either to show off to females or use them to battle rivals. This does raise the question of whether they moved in herds as they were all found together in this quarry. Though they could have been all part of one herd moving together, they also could have been individuals that arrived at the same location at different times. It's hard to say as we only have a snapshot of when they died and not how they lived. So it's equally likely that they were solitary or they were herd animals. For the record, there were an equal amount of both morphs located at Placerius Quarry, an interesting part of the find. Since they were found around a water source, does this mean Placerius was partially aquatic? As Placerius is sometimes thought to wade or even feed on aquatic flora, similar to hippos. Well, for that we would have to look at the formation that it was found in. The Chinle formation is well studied, but Placerius remains are comparatively quite rare. This is more about preservation bias than anything, as those species that lived around or in the water are more likely to get preserved. So it does indicate that Placerius was likely spending most of its time on dry land, and not frolicking in the water, likely only going to said water when it really needed to. In Walking with Dinosaurs, Placerius is portrayed as the last of its kind, as an endangered species on its last legs. But was this really true? Well, though Diectodons had reduced in number as the Triassic had gone on, they were still a common family amongst other late Triassic fauna. There were at least two other Diectodonts that lived alongside Placerius, and there are other members of this family that did live after Placerius and its relatives. In fact, they made it right to the end of the Triassic, and likely would have continued if not for the end Triassic mass extinction that wiped out much of the world's megafauna, and would clear the way for the dinosaurs to rise and take the places that were left vacant at the start of the Jurassic. So, Placerius. Who doesn't love the big round boys? And oddly, for a strange looking Triassic animal, it is fairly well known, even if some of the specifics have changed since its most famous depiction. But what do you think of Placerius? And for my question of the week, do you think Diectodonts would have continued on past the Triassic if not for the mass extinction? Or do you think that their time was coming to an end regardless? What lesser known extinct creature would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.